Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to The Behavioral Corner. (laughs) We made it to 2022. Uh, I'm Steve Martorano. I, I hang here on the corner and I wait for interesting people to come by and then we hang. We hang on the corner and we talk about stuff we uh, hope you'll find interesting and informative. What we deal with is uh, behavioral health issues. That's the biggest topic I could think of because it involves, well, this is a podcast about everything. The decisions we make, the choices uh, that we arrive at, and how it impacts our uh, physical, emotional and psychological well-being. That's the Behavioral Corner. It's underwritten by our partners, Retreat Behavioral Health, and you're invited to hang with us on the corner. I begin by uh, pointing out something that I've often said on the show, and that is that um, if you have not been impacted personally in your life or known someone close to you who have had uh, a substance abuse disorder or or gone through treatment and then recovery, um, then your impressions of that whole environment, that whole world is probably formed by the media. In fact, I'm certain it is. And most powerfully by by uh, by Hollywood. Um, we have an impression of what treatment is like, what addiction is like um, through mass media. And sometimes it's very accurate and dead on. Very often it uh, contributes to the myths, uh, misconceptions. And for many, many years, uh, the silences that surrounded substance abuse disorder. So we thought we'd cut through all that Hollywood stuff and get to somebody who uh, who works theatrically, but in uh, uh, the uh, nonfiction arena, he's a documentary filmmaker. Documentary filmmakers are among my favorite people. Uh, when they do it right, they, they're just a great uh, service to us. Greg Williams is our guest on The Behavioral Corner. Greg is an award-winning uh, filmmaker, as I said, uh, in the documentary filmmaking he's done uh, three very prominent feature-length documentaries about this, these topics, as well as uh, produced a couple of very uh, landmark uh, concerts um, that bring attention to this. Mo- most notably, I guess, was the concert to face addiction, which took place in Washington, uh, 2000. Was it 2015, Greg? Yep. Yeah, which brought, to be, uh, brought together uh, uh, an absolute, you know, A-list group of people from all walks of life. Uh, certainly uh, musicians and, and, and Hollywood types like that, uh, that, that really you know, brought this to the fore. So we welcome Greg Williams to the program so we can find out uh, you know, the skinny about this stuff and not the way Sandra Bullock has been trying to tell us it is. Greg, thanks for joining us on The Corner. You know, I have an idea, and I'll bounce this off you before we get to your stuff. I'm thinking about putting together a film critique segment on The Corner here where I get people who've been through substance abuse and recovery and we pick a a movie a month that deals with those subjects. And then I get them to say, okay, you're a film critic, but we're going to criticize this from the standpoint of, is this a good movie or is this a bad movie about the topic? What's your impression about what in general has been pumped out through, through Hollywood and, and movies and television about the issue of substance abuse disorder? Is it been a net positive or a net negative? It's a, it's a big question. Thanks for having me, Steve. Um, you know, I, I think it depends on um, what you're looking at. But, but it, oh, by and large, I, you know, I have made the films and I've gotten involved in storytelling um, in this space because I've, I've felt the need and a gap from the kinds of stories that, that are out there. And, uh, you know, growing up, you know, if you looked at the word addiction um, or told me about the word addiction, you know, in my teenage years, I had one view of it, right? And and that was the same old kind of addiction story that, that you know, we see over and over and over in the interventions or the reality shows or, or even in the scripted, you know, features. Um, you know, that said, I, I do think we're starting to see uh, a new iteration uh, just in the recent years with some some different kinds of approaches, different kinds of storytelling around this topic. Um, no shortage of, of media on this issue because it because it does impact everybody. Um, yeah. 
and and we've seen a ton but but you know in recent years i can point to some examples of movies that i think have have tackled the issue from a deeper perspective kind of getting under the surface of not just you know the character or the individual chose to be like that or or wants to be like that but getting to some underlying you know causes and conditions and and to some hope i mean the two that jump out to me if if you do do the the critique I, you know one film i think that hasn't gotten enough uh, praise is, is a film called Honey Boy. Um, Shia LaBeouf did a really nice job on, on his own journey. And there's a lot in there about childhood trauma and his father and all of that. And, and it's, yep. it's, it's really done well. And, and then the other ones, you know, that I point to often is Chuck Lorre and um, his show Mom, you know, did a really nice job as a sitcom, uh, to, you know, with a mom who, who's in recovery and, and a daughter and who's in recovery and they kind of Kristen Johnston actually, who was in the anonymous people Mm -hmm. joined the cast in the, in the later seasons of that show, but they had seven or eight years as a running sitcom on CBS and it was showing the recovery story. So those kinds of recent examples, I think do do a nice job at at getting to um, a lot more of the nuance of the issue than than, uh, so many of the examples out there. Yeah. There's been a sea change. I mean, there certainly has. So we're a long way from every, depiction of a substance abuser being a person of color, uh, you know, staggering around or creating crimes to something much, much bigger. So thanks for the two tips. They're both great. Uh, let's let's begin with uh, anonymous people, because th- this is talk about a myth exploder. Um, anonymous people, 2015, right? Is that when 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 that, uh, when no, that was uh, came out? 2020. 2013. I mean, we, we started oh, screening it a little bit in 2012, but it, in earnest, it theatrically opened in 2013. This was the story of uh, the, I think the, uh, I don't want to use dirty little secret, but the little secret, big secret, actually, that surrounded the issue of substance abuse, uh, that millions of people who get the help get better. Uh, and I think it, I, I know when I first heard about it and saw it uh, and we were doing this for a while, I thought, wow, that's a story that's got to be told way more often because it, all, it had always looked so hopeless. Uh, what was the origins of anonymous people in your, in your mind as a filmmaker? How did that come about? Yeah, you know, I didn't know I was going to make documentary films. I went to media, like I got into recovery at 17 and I, and I went to school for media production and I landed in a documentary film class and, and uh, I fell in love with the genre and, you know, the message of, you know, good documentaries are about access and, and your ability to access stories that people haven't heard or, or been able to see before. And, and because of my, own lived experience, I was able to to kind of have this viewpoint and this point of view that um, there was other elements to the story not uh, yet told. And um, and I met some people uh, after five, probably four or five years in my recovery, who were really sensational individuals um, working on policy and advocacy, and and they taught me about. Um, how to, you know, civically engage uh, using my story, but not uh, necessarily, um, you know, breaking any trans- traditions of a 12-step community. And, and that had always been kind of the thing that, that helped and still holds this uh, side of the story back. You know, you have, you have content creators, you have policymakers, you have all these people in all different walks of life who don't think they can talk about their lived experience, know, yeah. you know, with, with recovery because they're taught to be anonymous. And, and unfortunately uh, that's not, you know, the case in, in, in my viewpoint and, and based on, on, you know, that film, that's kind of the issue that we unpack um, is not only the, you know, who's telling their story publicly, but also the why people are telling their story publicly and then the how they're doing it in a way yeah. that, doesn't violate any traditions uh, or any um, game of telephone that, that's been told to, to people for generations around what they can and cannot do if, if they belong to an anonymous program. Well, prior to your documentary, Alcoholic, uh, Alcohol Anonymous, um, 
was probably foremost in people's minds. If they didn't know how it worked, they certainly knew about it. And it's in the name, uh, Alcohol Anonymous. And it was a very strong tradition for, for decades. Uh, and it's broken, it, it's broken down now. Most people I know who, who are in AA are, are forthright and ready to talk, talk to you about it. Uh, they don't talk about you know the process or anything, but they talk about being a member of that. I think your documentary went a long way towards breaking down the resistance to uh, to that. Uh, your great title, uh, a great story, and it needed to be told. Uh, I think I think your figure that you used in the film was twenty million people at that point were in long term recovery. Is that right? Yeah, there's been a couple of surveys since, but. 23 and a half million is, is typically right. the number that, that we cite that, you know, one in 10 Americans um, once had a problem with alcohol or other drugs and no longer does. Um, that might not match your definition of recovery, uh, but this is a big issue and it impacts a lot of people. So boiling it down to one single definition of, of recovery or your definition of recovery, you, met, you know. Uh, no, yeah, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond what you did. You, you, you uh, presented an, an opportunity for people to talk about it, from policymakers to people who've been through it, uh, lifting some of the shame burden, uh, some of, as I said, myths and mis misconceptions about this. Uh, I think it was a, a brilliant, a brilliant documentary. And, and, and I do want to say, like, a lot of what we did in the film was just kind of, you know, interview folks about their own history, uh, about the recovery movement. And we go back to Marty Mann we go back to Bill Wilson and we go back to some of the founders of the 12 step movement in, in, you know, who, who reconciled with this issue for, for years before the traditions were even written, right. uh, you know, and, and then look at, look at what, how they behaved right in the thirties, forties, fifties, like what happened about this secrecy of, of, of the, what happened was, you know, anonymity got commingled with being synonymous to secrecy. Um, through the game of telephone over the years. And that's not what it ever was intended for. And that's not what it was um, or should be in, in, in the view of the folks in the film and, and it, in my view. Um, you know, so people just have to understand that, that anonymity means something different than secrecy. Yes. And, or, and so or, 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 we, don't, we don't argue that anonymity should, should go by the wayside or that 12-step programs, you know, um, don't need to necessarily be anonymous for what they do in the community. Uh, but individuals who participate in those programs don't need to be secret about their recovery. Uh, Absolutely. There's a, there's a pretty bright line of, of a distinction there. Yeah. And I think uh, it, it, again, it, 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 it uh, sort of demolishes the notion that there's a uh, equivalency between anonymity and something we don't talk about because it's shameful or difficult uh, so, so to that end, it's been, it's been it was a great, great positive. So, tell me about Generation Found because I'm, I'm I'm not familiar with Generation Found. Yeah, uh, that was a film directed by Jeff Riley, who's who um, has been my partner and co-producing partner on on all these feature projects. He's uh, incredibly talented um, feature storyteller, uh, and and so while I often get a lot of credit for these projects. Jeff probably deserves more than, than I do um, in terms of the artistry of them. He, uh, it, it was about a um, recovery high school and, and a set in uh, a community down in Houston, Texas that developed um, a continuum of care for young people and how uh, engaged the community was in connecting young people not just in, in treatment or engaging them in treatment, but in a school-based environment and how to support them long-term. Um, and so it really looked at adolescence and the onset of, of addiction and, and the onset of recovery. And so uh, it was, a, we had unique access into um, these really sensational schools that, that are popping up around the country. Um, and we were able to tell a, a really human interest story of um, the educators and the students themselves uh, and the families involved in, in these programs we touch on a little of the collegiate recovery as well. Um, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's been a great film. And when we, when we, when we launched the film, um, there was something like you know, 30 some odd 
of these schools in the country. And now there's over 60 and, and more in development. So we're really excited about um, individual willingness to, to watch the film and then use the film in people's communities to, to start more programs for young people. Now, you know, the beauty of it is, of course, it, it highlights this notion of um, treatment as a process, not a single thing or 28 days someplace, but uh, an ongoing uh, process that, uh, to coin a phrase, takes a village to, to accomplish. So um, I guess that I guess young people really enjoy watching this. 30 now schools. Is there a name of the program or, or, or uh, of the uh, discipline uh, they're employing? Yeah, so it, I mean, people can go to like recoveryschools.org. Um, oh, so it's, okay. you, they have an association. Each school is an independent uh, school in local education system, so local in, in the United States. So uh, each school is in a local community governed by you know, the local education board. Uh, but there is an association of recovery schools. So people could Google that, the association of recovery schools and see where the schools are and, and where they operate. Um, and they also partner a lot with the Association of Recovery and Higher Education, which, which brings together all the collegiate recovery programs across the country. Um, wow. so we're, we're really starting to see the, the revolution of, of those um, uh, youth, youth focused programs. And I, and I will sure. say it's, 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 it's an interesting uh, tie to anonymous people because what happened in anonymous people is we touch on this stuff for five to seven minutes in a 84 minute film or whatever. And uh, after people wanted, they all wanted to talk about anonymity at first, but after they were, after we talk about anonymity, they all jumped to like these recovery schools. Like, what are these things? And, yeah, exactly. and so it, it, it really drove Jeff and I to want to dive deeper into that story and, and the sit in the community of Houston invited us in and, um, and so it's been kind of this organic journey of, of uh, you know, one film to the next one. But certainly a long way from the D.A.R.E. program, which was probably yeah. the most uh, notable uh, in-school uh, anti-drug, anti-substance abuse uh, program. Um, so we're, we're moving well past that. There's really been a, you know, because of the explosion of, in the problem with opioid uh, abuse. Uh, there's been an explosion in information, and we're grateful to have someone like uh, like you here to give us good information about it. Greg Williams is our guest, as I said, award-winning filmmaker. We're going through a couple of uh, his films, the third of which, in the mo most recent now, um, is something called Tipping the Pain Scale, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit uh, in terms of you guys are showing this around the country, and you're going to be showing it in our area where the corners produced in February. We'll find out about that ahead. Tell us about tipping the pain scale. Yeah, well, well, thank you. It's, yeah, we're excited to bring it to Allentown um, coming up on February 3rd. And it's a feature film, a, a character driven feature film. It, it just got finished in, in 2021. And now we're gonna be bringing it around the country. It features, um, some high profile folks and also features uh, some folks working on the grassroots, um, working on in unconventional ways or different kinds of ways uh, to, to address this issue. So uh, we have the former mayor of Boston, uh, Marty Walsh, uh, who is now the UN, United States Secretary of Labor. Uh, we have NFL Pro Bowl tight end Darren Waller, you know, in the film kind of telling his story on a different platform. Um, a community outreach individual in Philadelphia, Roz Picardo, doing street outreach. We, we've got uh, Joseph Green, who's a, a spoken word artist and educator um, who works with young people, the antithesis of, uh, in, in the antithesis of the D.A.R.E. program uh, for individuals who, who are not yet uh, struggling with addiction. And, and then, um, you know, so it's one thing to say, you know, uh, you know, the D.A.R.E. program doesn't work. It's another thing to point to what works or what could be instead of that. And, and I think uh, Joseph really speaks to that in this film um, without, you know, saying that explicitly, but demonstrating to people uh, what a different approach with young people could look like um, around uh, making healthy uh, choices. And, and then uh, we have- Well, you know, what's, yeah. Yeah, you know what's astonishing about that, uh, we are light years away from just say no. 
and just say no, it's not something from the Middle Ages. It was thought to be uh, perfectly um, obvious uh, and appropriate, and I guess uh, beneficial way of telling kids what to do, just say no. Um, wow, to, to where we are now. And there yeah. is, a, is an amazing, it's an amazing business. Uh, I mean, I, I wish we were, you know, I hope my eight-year-old son doesn't get taught that, but I, I don't hold out a ton of hope. Like it's, uh, <laughs> we still got a long way to go. I mean, there's a, there's but no, a no, lot. You know what I mean? That was, no, that, I know. That was like, it. I know. It's, it. it's, it's just it's, say no. Yeah, no, I, I, get it. I mean, people want, like, that's, I mean, that's what tipping the pain scale is about, right? Like people want, you know, that easy solution. Oh, we're going to stop prescribing opioids or we're going to uh, make all drugs legal or we're going to, you know, do that. And, and that's going to fit or we're going to sue pharma. Like, okay, those things are all, you know, but this thing is like, you, you don't take the addiction issue in America, boil it down to one policy, one practice and fix it. Like, I mean, look, look at the COVID pandemic. It's like, no, if we I, had, you're absolutely you know, I mean, if we, if people kind of like, I mean, if people, if we had a simple solution, we would, we would introduce it and it wouldn't be complicated. And I, and I think that's where people have to start, you know, diabetes, heart disease, like these are complicated interconnected issues um, yeah. of chronic illness that, that relate to our environment, our community, our sociology, our, our socioeconomic background, uh, the poison drug supply that we have, like all of these things. And, and, and we need to be able to have a, a nuanced conversation. And that's why Jeff and I love documentary film where we can, we can have that nuanced conversation over the course of 80 minutes with people um, or long, it's a little bit longer, but um, be able to unpack some of that nuance and some of that. Yeah. Emotion. Well, and, nuance, just these issues. Uh, nuance is the key here. I mean, well, you know, the funny thing about the difference between a theatrical film and a documentary film is that um, uh, you, you know, you, you have to fit fiction into a, a tidy little box and sort of make it make sense. And there's got to be a, a good guy and a bad guy and a conflict and then a resolution. And it seems so simple. And as you just described the problem, it is anything but simple. You know, I was struck in watching the trailer to um, tipping the pain scale with something one of the, your people said. I want you to uh, comment on this. Her quote was physical pain. The, the physical pain crisis led to the um, opioid crisis. She said, that's the general consensus. When um, it was the emotional pain crisis that led to the opioid crisis. In that, what did she mean by, I, I think I know what she meant, but this shows the size of the problem, right? Well, it, it shows that that's the that's 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 kind of the the goal of the title of the film and our artwork and mm -hmm. and Dr. Harrison, uh, who who is quoted there, um, is really getting to the core of of what we're tackling in the film. It's like, you know, everyone got shown, you know, on a scale of one to ten, you know, what's your level of pain, and and we're gonna fix it. We're gonna put a band aid on it. Um, but yet, you know, what doctors weren't taught or required to do was talk to people about their emotional pain. And if they had in the 90s and the 2000s, in addition to their physical pain, they might've been a little uh, less mm -hmm. um, uh, accepting to prescribe opioids because they would understand that like, well, while the, the opioid does work on the physical pain, there, if there's underlying stuff here, like that's, that's why alcohol works. That's why cocaine works. That's why marijuana works. Like, it, you know, these things work for people who become addicted, um, you know, for a reason. And there's underlying issues. And that's what the recovery journey is all about, right? Is, is once we're removed from, from the substance of addiction, then, then we can uh, start to, to dig into those issues and, and yeah. dig into the, the humanity. And then the, uh, the flip side, what we cover in the film is, is if there's no hope, if there's no compassion, if, if there's just scorn and hatred, like, what do we expect people who are living on the street? What do we expect? Pe like, how do, we, if we don't care about them, how do we expect them to care about themselves? Mm. You know, and so we, by, by scorning other people, we just, we create a, a bigger problem. We uh, just did a show uh, re uh, recently about uh, the harm reduction movement. 
which I know is goes right to, to the heart of what you just said. Look, if we there's a reason, I think this is correct, that the United States is the largest drug market on the planet. Uh, and a lot of those people take take these drugs for legitimate reasons, but many, many others wind up with a problem. And it's getting to naturally you have to fight the immediate problem so you don't lose people, which we've been doing. But we've got to get around to better answering questions about, well, why is that? What's what's causing all the pain uh, and despair that would uh, cause people to self-medicate and then wind up with a substance abuse disorder? And your work, you and your, your colleagues, um, go a long way. We have a great tradition in this country, and I'm, I've made documentaries for television. Uh, I know how hard they are when they're done well, how they can actually have a chain, make a, make a change. And so you guys are doing great work in that regard. Um, powerful documentary can change things. Um, you know, just most recently, we saw the movie uh, Ballyhooed, uh, Don't Look Don't Look Up or Look Up or whatever. I forget at this point. Uh, okay, a lot of Hollywood stars, a lot of hoopla. I don't know if it moved the needle much. I know a good documentary can. I've seen it over the years. Greg Williams is responsible for uh, many of them. We've been talking about a couple. We want to alert people in our area, and we'll have some information up on the site about the a screening that's going to take place in Allentown on February 3rd in conjunction with Greg and his people and our underwriters who treat behavioral health. We'll give you more information about that down the road. Um, Greg, how do people, uh, I mean, these are not the sort of films you, you might stumble upon in your neighborhood theater. Uh, if people want to show these to youth groups or whomever, what do they have to do to find out more information? Yeah, we'll list all our information. We're, we're just launching community screening opportunities at tippingthepainscale.com. Uh, tippingthepainscale.com, and, and I appreciate that very much. It's it is an independent film, and, and this uh, it takes a community, it takes a village to get it out there. And, and we've been blessed with uh, people who are working on these issues in, in their communities, uh, wanting to have discussions. So um, that's what we try, and that's who we make these films for: is is for people to bring people together, have a discussion, talk about the nuance, talk about how it relates in their community. Um, and that, you know, that's the, the, the dedicated audience down the road later in the year, we'll, we'll get it on all the platforms, you know, for video on demand and people can, uh, watch it from home and whatnot, but we want to make sure that, that, uh, community organizations and, um, people have an opportunity to see it in their community and have a discussion and, and all of that, um, you know, prior to, to people, uh, experiencing the film, you know, by themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, we're we'll certain. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, to the point of a good documentary can change things. It's I I, I totally believe that uh, the challenge, right, is a good documentary experience by yourself um, in your home. I I, I find uh, powerful, but less impactful and less uh, societal shifting than a good documentary experience with 60, 100, 200 people in a community. No, oh, yeah, sure. You, you light a fire under a few people and see if they can change stuff. That's the best way. Greg Williams, thanks so much for joining us. We will uh, put on the Corners uh, website uh, the, the necessary links so people can get more information about uh, tipping the pain scale. And uh, we hope we can have you back. Are you working on anything uh, right now? Anything down the road that you can talk about documentary wise? Yeah, we, so Jeff and I have, have just launched a new effort uh, called High Watch Media, um, and we uh, we announced a, a, a film called Born to Serve that's in production around a tennis player. Um, Jeff also, Jeff Riley has edited and produced uh, a bunch of 30 for 30, so this is like his world coming ah. together between uh, recovery and tennis and, and sports, and so uh it, it, it's going to be a great film about murphy jensen and the jensen brothers uh who who have a hero's journey on on multiple levels um and then we're also working on a history series called meccas of recovery um uh, that should be out um you know probably next year uh at some point so we've got a couple well, of things good, that works. Good, good luck there uh sounds exciting um and thanks again for joining us on the behavioral corner yeah thanks
Have a good day. Hey, guys, thanks for hanging. Uh, don't forget, follow us on Facebook and, you know, like us. We, we love when you like us. And uh, we'll catch you next time for another good hang, Behavioral Corner. Bye-bye. Retreat Behavioral Health has proudly been serving the community for over 10 years. Here at Retreat, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer a comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 or visit us at www.retreatbehavioralhealth.com to begin your journey today.